Got a few minutes left. Good to have you, the live stream audience. Good to have you all with us um, uh, here for this unusual service that we're having. I think every service here is unusual. <laughs> we don't have, no, no two are really alike. But for the next few minutes, we've got just a few minutes left. Turn to John chapter 21. I'll show you something in 4A title. The name of this will be called The Feeding of the Lambs. That's kind of a little throw off. Remember the movie The Silence of the Lambs? This one is the feeding of the lambs. John chapter 21, Jesus is talking. He said in verse 15, When they had dined, say it, they dined together. <laughs> Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He said unto him, Yes, Lord, you know I love thee. He said, Feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. He said, Feed my sheep. And he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. What he's saying to him here is that your evidence, the proof that you love me, is you'll feed what's important to me. And of the three times, he said the lambs first and then the sheep twice. The lambs are just baby sheep, and he put them first, didn't he? You know, Jesus exhorted, feed my lambs at the top of the list. It's his first priority. Say that with me. The lambs, lambs. are first priority with God. <laughs> you know, in natural feeding, we get the boys and girls settled first before we adults sit down and eat, don't we? We get them all settled, get them set, because they can't really fix for themselves. And if you, there's no sense you sitting down and eating, knowing that they're going to need fed. So since you're the parent and they can't take care of themselves, you get the babies fixed first. As soon as they're settled. I remember a few months ago, we were having a dinner out on our back deck, and we set the little table up, and Nick and Kylie were sitting there, and they were kind of whining, and they were making ready, and... and uh, uh, Nick said, Papa John, Papa John, Papa John walked over and said, what, bud? They're just sitting there waiting. And Kylie said, would you get our food? <laughs> and I said, yeah, baby, I'll get your food. And Janie said, they're hungry, aren't they? I said, yes, they are. So we got them settled, got them fixed, and they're sitting there, look like a little couple out there out to, out to eat. And uh, look at Luke chapter 18. I want to show you something here so important. I can show you in the scripture where Jesus ministered to kids eight times in the book of Matthew alone. He ministered to children eight different times. Seven solid times in one, one reference. But in, um, in Luke chapter 18, I'll show you his priority here once again. I'll tell you, if, if Jesus did it, we ought to do it. Isn't he our example? Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 15. They brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. But when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer the little children un to come unto me. Forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall in no wise enter therein. And then there's a companion scripture to that. Look in Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. Mark 10, verse 13, they brought young children to him that he should touch them. This is not the same reference. One time they brought infants. Another time they brought little children. And Jesus answered the same way. The reason I know these are two different times is the Bible says if you were to write down everything Jesus did, the world itself should not possibly contain all the books that ought to be written. This is not the same instance. These are two different instances. So if one time was infants, one time was little children, he said the same thing. Suffer the little children to come to me. Forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. And he said it again, I'm telling you, whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will not enter therein, because a child will have faith. Quickly, they'll have faith. Jesus' ministry, children, were priority one. 
And if they were priority one in His ministry in the earth, Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means His priority, priority one, is children today, as they, they always were. Nothing has changed. Natural ministry is just as important as spiritual ministry. You know, the devil is such a coward. He is. He's ruthless, and he'll attack a child just like he'll attack an adult. Kids have problems just like adults do. And you need to understand that when you minister to kids, God looks at it as just as if you're ministering to anybody else. He's no respecter of persons. In fact, the Scripture says that somebody that would hurt one of these little ones that believe in me, it would better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the bottom of the ocean. That's just what he thinks of somebody that hurt a child. What kind of a demon would hurt a baby? And the court systems are full of people that, have had, that, that do so. And I've seen, I've seen judges just absolutely have almost no mercy whatsoever over that. They say there's a code among thieves in the prisons. And when some new prisoner comes in that has molested a child or hurt a child, all the, the uh, other inmates blackball him. They, he's, no, he's just like a, <clears throat> it's worse than being a cop killer. Well, um, as I said, natural ministry is just as important. And, look, and go, to, go to Matthew chapter 10. I'll show you the natural side. Natural ministry Spiritual means like Par Carla went up and, and, and performed a, I'll call it performance, a performance of dealing with demons, dealing with devils, dealing with the, with the child, and staying with it until she, until she got victory, until she got a breakthrough. And that was spiritual ministry. Look here in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 41. I think it's 1041. Am I right? Let's see. No, I've written it wrong. It's the scripture that says that <clears throat> Jesus said, if you so much as give a cold cup of water unto one of these, my, in the name of a disciple, one of the little ones, you'll in no wise lose your reward. So a baby, when you're in a, in a nursery or in your, if you're in a children's ministry setting, the little babies, they, the little boys and little girls, they'll need a little drink of water and a, a little cracker or something. They'll need a little bathroom break a little, much more often than adults do. And if you see to those things, if you see to a diaper change or you, or you see to just a little drink of water, a little cup of juice or something or cracker, God sees that as you'll not lose your reward by taking care of these babies in that manner. Natural ministry to Him is just as important as spiritual ministry. And it's not like we start off in children's ministry and one day we get promoted to big church. No, let me tell you, promotion starts right there in the children's ministry. That's the way He sees it. And uh, It was the second verse. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Now also, the, um, <clears throat> when natural needs are met, the scripture says that they are rewarded. Now, I had a person say to me, you notice how Miss Lynn was offering, uh, uh, we've got a store down there in, in the children's church, and, and you get 150 points. That's the big one. If you learn your memory verse, you get 150 points. So they, they are incentivized to learn that. And once they build up enough points, once a month they can go redeem those points for items in the store. Someone said to me years ago, why are you commercializing? Everything is so commercial. Why do you want to bring commercialization? Why don't you just teach the Bible? Why is everything about a, a toy gun or a, or a piece of candy? Or why, do, why, why do we do this? There's always somebody who wants to challenge the pastor's decision on things like that. Not many, but once in a while, those are the ones you remember. You know, the snit, that's the one that's, that you remember. I said, well, I know this, Jesus is a rewarder. He said, if you'll pray in secret, your Father will reward you out in the open. If you fast in secret, your Father will reward you out in the open. He told Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. He called him a reward. He said, to him that overcomes will I grant to sit with me. He offered reward after reward after reward for faithfulness, for work, there's, there are soul winners' crowns waiting on the soul winner. James Satcher is a soul winner. Yes, amen. And there's going to be a crown so big he won't be able to stand up under it. God said, I'll reward you if you do these things. I believe in rewarding them. Yes, sir, give them an incentive. And I believe in keeping the prize. In fact, Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus, had it not been for a reward, probably could not have possibly endured the cross. It says that for the joy that was set before him, 
He kept his eye on the prize of the joy that will come for having obeyed his father and gotten the job done and redeemed mankind. But by keeping that joy, that, that reward in front of him, he was able to endure the cross. See, yeah, I believe in it. We got a store set up and we got it lit up and we spend money on it and we put things in there. And just think of it like this, parents. If, if, if we don't give them a football for bringing a bunch of kids to church and learning their memory verse, you got to buy it at Walmart. So lighten up on Pastor John about that a little bit. We're helping you out here. Yeah, I believe in incentivizing them. In incentives are always good. Keeping your eye on the prize is always good. And we start it young. Plus, they'll realize that God is a rewarder because Pastor John was a rewarder. And they don't, know, they make, they don't make a distinction between Pastor John and God right now when they're this, this age. Amen. Children's ministry is not actually an office. In the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, you'll find the five offices of ministry. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. They're given for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministries, for the edifying and overall building up of the body of Christ. But you won't find children's ministry in there. However, you find seven or eight times where Jesus ministered to kids in the book of Matthew alone. And the children's ministry that operated in Jesus' ministry, somebody needs to do it today because He did it so much. The, this children's ministry operates under the pastor's office to nurture and care as it is necessary. Feeding the lambs at Church on the Word will always be our first priority here. I've seen churches, in fact, I went to a great church back in the 80s, fabulous church, wonderful spirit-filled experience. Gifts of the Spirit operating and flowing like, I mean fabulous, wonderful, excellent ministry. While we had a Christian school, the pastor didn't have a vision for children's ministry. He wanted always to keep the children close to the parents, and I understood where he was coming from. And parents do need to have their children. And I like to once a month or so, once every six weeks, bring all the kids in here. And so the kids can, I, that's why I like to let, let the kids watch you worship, because the kids will watch you worship, and they'll worship. They will. I've watched little Kylie watching her mama up here singing, and she wants to sing like her mama. Remember what little Heidi said? She saw, was it Andrea or Vicky singing? She said, she said, I want to sing like Kylie's mommy. She was standing up in the car and she was singing like Kylie's mommy. See, they learn. They watch. Remember the scripture says that Jesus went in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They had laid their, their clothes on that, that uh, donkey's back, put him on it, strode the uh, palm leaves in the path, and there was thousands in front of him and thousands behind him, all shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord! And when they went into the temple... Oh, the Pharisees got aggravated. They, Jesus performed miracles, but the Pharisees did not get nearly as aggravated. They were not as stirred up by the devil over his miracles as they got stirred up over the kids when the kids were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! And the Pharisees smugly said to Jesus, Do you hear what these are saying? Command them to shut up. And Jesus said, If they shut up, the rocks will cry out. You know why the devil gets more upset over kids that will worship God than even the miracles Jesus performed? Because he knows that, that a miracle is a, is a thing that happens here and it's over with. But this next generation coming up is, I am doomed if this one comes up. That's what he knew. That's why he stirred them up so about it. No, you train them how to worship God. You train them how to give praises unto God and sing. You train them how to speak, how to talk the Word and get the Word in their mouth. And when they grow up, they won't have the troubles that I had as a child. They won't have the bullies that deal with you and evil spirits. See, even a bully in an elementary school or high school is not the problem. That person, that flesh is not the problem. It's the spirit driving them. But when you can teach a child to rebuke a devil... You can take authority. That child can take authority. You think, don't think that's over the top spiritually? Watch. Well, you've you got, you got an opportunity. Either let the child have the same problems you had as a child or take authority over the devil and walk in, walk in freedom and liberty. Kids, kids, kids on the Word. Kids on the Word. Say it. Yes, kids on the Word. Do you love me? Y'all love me? I surely love you. You love me, I need you to help me feed my lambs. Feed my babies. Feed them and love them. Take care of them, hold them, nurture them. Simplest thing in the world. 
You can take up a little baby in the nursery. After a while, if they see you for a little bit, the baby gets to where they used to you, and they'll reach for you just like that. Don't be jealous. Just hand the baby over to the nursery worker. I've seen Miss Jackie. She's like a little wizard with them. She just loves them. You know, you can teach a child, Jesus loves the baby. He does. Jesus loves this baby. You hold up, show, show me the mirror. See that girl right there in the mirror? See her? Jesus loves that baby. And that baby will remember it. Jesus loves that baby. I never had anybody tell me Jesus loved me. All oh, my childhood, I don't remember it. I would have remembered it. I remember one time I was on a kick of talking about how that people just need to know that Jesus loves them. They just need to know. If the world knew that Jesus loved them, we wouldn't have near as many problems. I was in a, co a contracting business at the time, long before I started the church, which has been nearly 20 years ago now. And there was a man that stole $1,000 from me. He meant to rip me off from day one. I'd got the job done. It was a $1,000 job. I was about three days before my house payment was due, and I worked hard and got that thing done, and he didn't pay me, and he was wealthy. He owned condos in Florida, and he owned mountain homes in the mountains, and he had more money than you could squeeze out. It's, I don't know, it just bothered me. He had a HVAC company, and his trucks ran all over Atlanta, and he was, he was just determined to avoid me and not pay me. So I did what any diligent man would do. I sent Janie down there to collect. <laughs> yes, sir. It's harder to tell a woman no. When he still put us off, Janie said, you going to say anything to him? I said, yeah, I'm, I tell you, I'm, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say, Aaron Luke run up to him, you're going to say him, Jesus, just loving him, in you, daddy? I said, I'm not going to say that to him. No. He wound up ripping me off about half of it, but that's okay. He was driving his truck down the road one day and had a seizure, hit head on, cut his head off. Praise the name of the Lord my God that doth deliver me from all of my enemies. Hallelujah. Boy, they're tentative about saying amen to that. I don't care. I don't care to preach. It'll preach. Hey. Hey, when it, let me tell you something. God is a whole lot more quick about judgment when it comes to money than anything else. Ask Ananias and Sapphira. New Testament. Church age. Did you sell the land for so much? Yep, for so much. Mistake. He dropped down dead suddenly. He said, what? who tempted you to lie to the Holy Ghost? You're selling the land to be able to help fund this new church in its infancy, and you sell it for a part of it and tell me you sold it for all of it. It's a, it's a basic accounting. It's a ba the first fudging of the books in the body of Christ. His wife's out shopping. She came in three hours later, about the average shopping spree. Came in, said, Sister Sapphira, did you sell the land for so much? Mm -hmm, for so much. Mistake. The guys that have just buried your husband to come get you, she fell down dead suddenly and they picked her up and took her out and buried her by her husband. Yeah. Rip a man of God off like that, you might wind up in the, in the grave right next to him, pushing up daisies. Pastor, what's this got to do with children's ministry? We got ways of teaching the children exactly these Bible truths at their level. We've got puppets to teach them. We've got Rover Cumber, the faith dog. He's a cool dog. And he shakes hands with him. And I'm telling you, Rover Cumber, the faith dog, is a scary looking dog. We had him one time at a festival. Big thing, big, big nose out here. Big, got big eyes. And he comes walking out at a festival, shaking hands with the kids. And there was one uh, lady that was there with a little boxer dog, a little shorty little boxer dog, walking him around. And when that boxer dog saw Rover Cumber, the faith dog, His stomach jerked, and suddenly from his southbound direction, he took off in a northbound direction. I don't know what it was. But it looked like it looked like latte to me. Yes, sir. Took off running, bolted, broke the hasp off in her hand. He took off running, clawing the pavement, took off running, and then that, there was a stob that was standing up holding down a, 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 a cross tie. And that thing caught his chain and spun him around. If it had not caught him, that dog would still be running. No doubt about it. But the kids love him. 
They do. They don't, they don't have their picture made of Robercomer, the faith dog. And Robercomer will interact with the puppets and with the teacher. And, and we've spent 600 bucks on Robercomer alone. And the puppets are worth thousands of dollars. And the curriculum has been... The curriculum we use, the man that designed it spent a million five hundred thousand dollars finding out what works with kids and what doesn't. And he just shaved off what doesn't and, and kept what works. And we teach them. It's all interactive. And you can work with video. Uh, and you can work with, with skits and work with puppets. And we can teach them. And we can teach them. You love me? Help me feed my lambs. All right. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to focus now for the fall. We're going to build a whole new, we're going to revamp all the children's church area. We're going to build a whole new closet with a big puppet stage with a roll-up door. It's going to be great. And, um, and it's going to be easy for you to learn, and we'll train you and teach you and show you how to do it. And it's a lot of fun. I'll tell you what, I've never had a person yet that does the puppet ministry that tells me that the puppet ministry taught them things about the Bible that they didn't know. So see, the puppet ministry, designed for children, teach adults. <laughs> and, uh, so here's the kind of help that we don't want. First of all, there are four types of people that I do not need in children's ministry. Here they are. Say, four types, Pastor. The first one is the clown, the guy that dresses like he's a cartoon. He's all fun. He does flips and turns, and he really doesn't have any substance. A lot, he's funny, and the kids enjoy him, but you really don't teach him anything. You don't need a clown. And there's also, then the second one is the drill sergeant. He's the guy that's no fun. He's all law. He's all make everybody sit straight, preach long sermons at him. The kids don't really have a lot of fun, so we don't need a drill sergeant either. Then there's the guy that's the super spirit. This is the person that prays all the time. Oh, we're going to teach your kids how to pray. Bring them down and teach them how to pray. And it's really, they're self-seeking because if the kids pray a lot, then they go home and the parent gets to hear how wonderful the teacher is teaching us how to pray. And the super spirit is not what we need. Also, there's, I, and we used to have these. I've had this on the platform before, one that's persecuted. I don't need the persecuted, the one that says, nobody's for me. I leave from here. I have to go down in that dungeon down there. And nobody even knows what I do. Nobody appreciates my children's ministry. I don't need a persecuted person either. I had a person one time say to me, I just want to work in this ministry. I'm, we're leaving this church. So we, we don't ever get used. I said, we had some cards we offered. to, to if, if just not working, not being used is what's keeping you, to, uh, wanting you to make you want to go somewhere else. I, that's fine. You can go where the Lord leads you, but if that's what you need, I've got some things you can do. So they decided since they weren't being used, they wanted to leave. So, but if you're going to use me, great, we'll stay. So they worked for about three months, and they were testifying to everybody. They felt like they were just being used. Some people you just can't seem to find a place in the body of Christ, you know. And I said to them as they were departing, let me see, you wanted a place in ministry because you weren't being used. We put you in children's ministry, and you felt like you were being used. Here's the right help. Say, right help, Pastor. I'm looking for four qualities. First of all, I'm looking for the person that has the positive approach. Somebody that will just work with what you have. What if we don't really have anything? What if we didn't have a puppet stage? What if we didn't have any puppets? We didn't have any curriculum. We didn't have anything. Did you know that if you can just find a cardboard box that housed a refrigerator, take that thing and bring it to church, spray paint it, and... Get you a sock and sew a couple of buttons on it and stick it right out of the top of the cardboard box, just like that. And the kids will think it's the coolest thing in the world, and you'll be in a cardboard box talking. Remember, remember when I was a kid, I remember that, uh, remember lamb chop? It's just a the lady, what was the name of the lady? I can't remember her. She, just, she, saw, she made that thing look like it had this cowl, had this, uh, uh, like, it had a, like it had fleece on it. And lamb chop would just talk. I still remember lamb chop. A child will listen to the Bible being read to them through that puppet a lot quicker than they will listen to an adult talk to them. However, I've seen where, um, well, let me finish this up and I'll show you some of the examples. A positive approach, somebody will just work with what we've got I know other churches have better things than what we have. They've always had better things than what we've had. But I have found out that if you'll just work with what we have, God will, he said, if you will just be faithful in what you have, God will give you more. Amen, somebody. Amen. Also, the next, uh, aside from the positive approach, I'm looking for the person that is organized. 
person that delegates knows how to recruit and inspires people. Also, I'm looking for a creative thinker. There was a time that Willie George was saying that he, he said they were, they were trying to figure how you can teach kids about the perils of drug addiction. How do you teach that to these kids this size? You think kids right now need to be told about drugs? Yeah. Oh yeah, honey, we're already late. So one of his workers came to him because he was a creative thinker. He said, Pastor George, I've got this styrofoam head that my wife put a wig on. Anybody remember those styrofoam heads that's got wigs on them? <laughs> and he said, I painted a face on it and said, this is your brain and drew a brain on the top of it. He said, then I got some of her uh, fingernail polish remover and poured it on top of it and it just ate it up and said, this is your brain on drugs. And he said, it's really cool. You think I could show that to the kids in, in children's church? And he said, yes, yes, that's exactly the visual aid I'm looking for. A creative thinker. A creative thinker. That's what I'm looking for. Also, finally, you've got to have the person that follows the pastor's vision and heart. I'm still their pastor. I still have to be their pastor. They love Pastor John. The babies do. And the person that loves Pastor John that's got a, and is following my heart for my kids and has the same love in their heart for my babies that I have and is a creative thinker and organized and delegates and recruits and inspires and has a positive approach that doesn't feel persecuted, is not a super spirit and always a drill sergeant, never acts like a clown. That's the one I'm looking for. And let me tell you something. I hadn't had to look in a lot of years. Stand up, Lynn Lewis. This one here is not a clown. She's not a drill sergeant. She's not a super spirit. She never acts persecuted. She's always up. She all, turn around, everybody see your face. She's always bubbly. She is one of the most positive people I have ever met in my life. She's enthusiastic. And you know she delegates and, and she recruits because I've seen some of y'all running from her while she's after you trying to recruit you. <laughs> yes, sir. I know her. Yes, sir. She's organized. She's a creative thinker. And she has always, always had my heart and had this pastor's heart. My God. Yeah. Mm. Let me tell you something else, too. Harold, Harold to go to telling the kids, he'll get down there with her and, and tell them a story about his childhood. And they'll lock in and get quiet, and they're mesmerized. And can you imagine Harold telling a story? About this, about this, about this tone of voice right here. And they'll all just be listening. Yeah, got their attention. Amen. You can be seated. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do children's church, and we're going to focus on it. It's going to be better than it's ever been. And we're about to, uh, to uh, take it to the next level. Now, I'm not going to just ask you to come in, do puppets, and here, here's your puppet, here's your, the stage, go for it. I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to do is show you the million and a half dollars that's been, not, well, I'd like to show you the money, but I'll show you the, the <laughs> curriculum. I'll show you the curriculum that, that a million and a half dollars was spent on to, to make work. I'll show that to you. I'll show you how it interacts with, uh, with the, the stories. I'll show you the, I want to show you the icebreaker skits. Those are the coolest things. And then I want to show you also uh, the area that we're going to be building new stage. I'm going to be calling on you in the next week to help me do some uh, uh, carpentry in the next week or two and some painting and we're going to really make it cool. We're going to, we've got a whole new bunch of lighting that's going to go on down there. It's going to be really, really cool. And, uh, but before I just put you in it, I'm going to take time to show you and train you and let you see everything before we employ you. You'll know in advance what to do and be comfortable with it. Now, I thought that I would next Saturday do a quick training here beginning at 9 in the morning, and we'll go through the puppets, we'll go through the, the uh, curriculum, we'll go through the other areas of children's ministry, and not just children's ministry. This is, um, we're also, those of you that have a heart for the teens, um, Kelsey's got my heart for these teenagers. She does. She's, her, she, it's the real, y'all helped put her through some training a few months ago, about $600 worth of training. I appreciate that. <laughs> And my teenagers are just as important to me. In fact, my teenagers of today were my children's church of yesterday. And I was telling you earlier about the church that we once went to that had a great, fabulous, it was the church to go to in 
this county for a spirit-filled experience. But because the pastor did not have exactly a vision for children's ministry, that church lasted one generation. And its, its import, its impact, and its promotion and its revival waned after that one generation because there was no one in the end to come up. And the, the children of that generation were not seen to like the adults were. It's not big church and little church. It's church. Jesus said, you love me? Feed my lambs. You love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed them. Feed them. Teach them. Train them. Show them. Fill them full of the Word when they're grown. Scripture says that you can train up a child in the way they ought to go. It doesn't say when they're old and they all run out in the world, they'll eventually come back. It says they won't ever go out in the world. They never will go in the first place. Train them up in the way they should go when they're old. They won't depart from it. I like babies that'll tell their parents, don't post a, one child told their daddy, don't post a provoke them to, to wrath. Mm hmm Yes, sir. The Bible says it, don't post a steal. Can you imagine that? A baby tell, mm -mm, don't post a steal. What was it that I heard that one baby say, don't post a do adultery? <laughs> one baby said that to their mama. Where'd you learn that? In church. Teach them. Train them. Jenny and I were teaching a class one time on child training. And we gave one class, one afternoon, the liberty of the hickory switch. I was raised with it. I didn't see a thing wrong with it. So I brought it, showed them what it looked like, broken off. Showed them. I even took one and smacked a girl one time on the leg. See, did that sting a little bit? She said, yes, that's what it's got to feel like. She had that little wooden spoon, and she was touching them like they thought it, they would just suddenly go into a trance. It would be perfect if she touched them with it. And it wasn't working. Because, no, it's got to sting their flesh. Well, she went home and started exacting requirements from her children. And when I got in that next Sunday, I was walking down the hallway about to go to the Sunday school class, and somebody pushed me on the back. I turned around and looked, and there was this little girl, not that tall. She's, you can't teach my mama no more. <laughs> well, she said to me, her mama done lit her up. Mm-hmm, yes, sir. And she came right to the point of her problem. She knew I was the, uh-huh, you want not talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, see, we believe in teaching you from both ends. Teach you from the child up and from the adult down. Yeah. Yeah, you might think at a casual observance of this that we're just a bunch of Abusers. No. Listen, I've been spanked. My mama lit me up. I don't remember this story, but I do remember hearing tell all over, my, over, over the years that with the day we moved in that house over on Fairburn Road and had a fenced-in backyard, and mom said, you can't go out there. You have to stay in the backyard. There are parts of this I do remember, but... I remember watching Grady and his new friend Richard Samples throwing the baseball and Wanda was out there and Butch was out there and I'm looking through the backyard fence at him. So I saw where, how Grady opened the fence gate, went out and locked it back. So when he did that, I just went over there and opened the little fence gate, went out, locked it back and went out there with him, just like them. When mom saw me, grabbed me up. I, re I distinctly remember her holding me up in my toes, barely on the ground. She lifted me up and turned me around, I'm, put my feet on solid ground, and tore my rear end up, and put me in the backyard. Stay in the backyard. And I told her through tears and snubbing, that when I get older, I'm going to have two backyards, so I don't have to go in one of them. That's what I told her. So now that I'm a grown man, I have two backyards. One's here. And one is in Cave Spring, Georgia. And if I don't want to go in one of them, I don't. Did you learn something today? Amen. Amen. <laughs> I want to thank you for joining us today for the WordWise Christian Broadcast right here from Church on the Word in Douglasville, Georgia. 
And I want to remind you that this is the Bible. That's it right here. God gave it to us to get our thinking straightened out. When you get your noggin straightened out, that's when your life changes. Get our thinking straightened out. When God's mindset becomes our own, peace settles in. Our hearts settle. Our soul becomes anchored. Our actions change. And we become word-wise. Word -wise. Amen. See you next week. God bless you. Y'all give me a hand.